Everyone that has a set of lungs should be here. <laughs> the respiratory organs are very important. Do you remember the most vital element needed for life? It's oxygen. And oxygen is taken into our body through our lungs. And there's only one way that the oxygen should be getting into our lungs, and that is through our nose. Nose, let's make a list of what nose does. And you might be surprised at this list. It's not a surprise that it purifies the air. Nose warms the air. And that's important because we're warm-blooded creatures. And when you open your mouth wide and take air in there, it doesn't, does not warm the air. <coughs> Nose also moistens the air. So it prepares it perfectly. And nose also pressurizes the air. I think that should be a Z. It also balances blood gases. Only nose does this. Mouth does not do that. And many people's respiratory organs are suffering because bad air is going into their lungs. And this is not the odd time it happens or the odd time it does. It's just day after day after week after week after month after month after year after year after year. And so then the question arises, well, why do people breathe through their mouth? Because their noses are blocked up. Did you know that 90% of people, it is estimated, have a deviated <coughs> septum? And the deviated septum is a little bit of crookedness in the nose. And one of the reasons that this happens is mouth breathing. Because when you breathe predominantly through your mouth, the little canals at the back of your nose close up. And if someone wanted to have the back of their nostrils cleared out, can you imagine how painful that operation is? And sometimes if it doesn't work and they go in again to drill out the back, they can drill too much and that person will be left with an empty nose for the rest of their life, which is incredibly painful. But you know, there is no need to have any operations on your sinus, on your nose. No, no, no. Very painful. And there's no need. Because believe it or not, one of the easiest ways to clear the nose is to close your mouth and not breathe through your mouth and force your body to breathe through your noses. And then little by little by little, those little canals at the back of your nose, they start to widen. You know the old saying, if you don't use it, you will lose it. It's absolutely so for those little canals at the back of the nose. And when you realise what nose does, you can see it's imperative that we breathe through our noses. And then someone might say, but... I'm all blocked up. Why? Possibly because of breathing in chemicals. Breathing in chemicals can irritate the mucous membranes and when the mucous membranes are irritated, more mucus is produced to protect the mucous membranes. That's what the mucus is there for, to protect. So chemicals can do it. Also mould. Breathing in mould, mould is toxic. The body sees the mould as an enemy. So when you breathe in mould, again, that can cause excess mucus, which tends to block the airways. And so the easiest thing for the person is just to breathe through the mouth. But there are certain foods that are classified as mucus-forming foods. So the five most common allergens, and we've looked at these a few times, is dairy. 
Professor Walter Weith has a, a great series on health and one of his one of his presentations is called Utterly Amazing. <laughs> and it shows how many people have allergy to dairy. The only people that really can handle dairy or cow's milk is when it's in their, in their heritage. Maybe your, your fifth generation dairy farmers. <laughs> so it's in your genes, the enzymes are in your gut. But you know, cow's milk is excellent milk for baby calves. And milk, God, God created mammals to produce milk to feed their babies. So when people say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned, I eat food. Because <laughs> milk is for babies. <laughs> and traditionally, in a lot of dairy farming countries, the cow's milk, a lot of it was made into yogurt. A lot of it was made into fresh cheeses. And when, when the cow's milk is made into yogurt and made into the fresh cheeses, it actually breaks down, the culturing process breaks down those, those big curds and does make it a little bit easier for the gut to digest. It is estimated in Australia, I was reading the figures that 60% of Australians have an allergy to milk. And yet far more than 60% of Australians would drink milk. But if the milk was raw from an organic cow, the allergy would be brought down to probably about 30%. If you were to give a newborn calf the cow's milk that's in the, in the supermarket, that calf would die because it has no vitamin C in it, the whole structure has been changed. Pasteurisation of milk only was really necessary because of dirty dairies. If the dairy's clean, if the milk, everything around it is clean, that there's no need to pasteurise it. But when you bring it to the boil and pasteurise it, it changes the milk, it kills the vitamin C in the milk. So dairy is a very mucus forming food and also the hybridised wheat. The wheat was hybridised in the 1950s and the hybridisation of the wheat created a very complex protein structure. And that protein structure is so complex that the body creates antibodies because it's very difficult for the gut to the gut to break down this very complicated protein structure. You see, the original wheat, Enkenhorn, it had a very fragile protein structure, very easy to break down. And wheat traditionally was always cultured, always made in the sourdough bread. Let's have a look at the best history book we've got, which is the Bible. And let's have a look at Moses in the desert with millions of people. And every year they commemorated the Passover. The Passover, when the angel passed over the, the doors of the Israelites, if you know the story. So they commemorate that time. And in commemoration of the Passover, for one week they put all leaven out of their houses. What was the leaven? It was none other than the sourdough culture. You see, yeast was not produced really until the Industrial Revolution. So before the Industrial Revolution, all bread was made with the sourdough method. I've just come from Germany. There's, you know, in fact, the best bread I've ever tasted is German bread. You can get it anywhere. <laughs> Very nice. And it's, it's mostly, there are some that do the yeast, but it's mostly made with the sourdough method. And the sourdough or the cultured bread breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain. So when you eat sourdough bread, you're eating pre-digested grain because the culturing process has broken down that, that uh, protein structure. But the hybridised wheat of the day, it's a very complex structure. And even when the hybridised wheat of today is made into a sourdough, it is still more complex a structure than the original. And that's why a lot of people react to that hybridised wheat. Oats are a food that are very high in something called lectins. You've heard of lectins? So let me give you a quick explanation of lectins. Lectins 
are found in unripe fruit. And when the fruit ripens, there's no more lectins. So it's almost as if God put it there to deter us from eating the unripe fruit. Now let's say that someone eats fruit that's not quite ripe. If they've got good gut flora, that disarms the lectin, so it doesn't even get into the blood. Remember though that gut flora plays a protective role? If the lectins do get into the blood, they cause inflammation. Traditionally, oats, well the Scottish have always eaten a lot of oats, oats were soaked all day and slowly cooked all night and that disarms the lectins. Legumes are high in lectins, but if you soak them and rinse them well and pressure cook them or slow cook them, that disarms the lectins. Tomatoes, uh, you call it bell pepper, and uh, eggplant or aubergine, high in lectins, but traditionally the Europeans always de-seeded and skinned the tomatoes and the bell pepper and that takes the lectins away. So again, getting back to the traditional way of cooking foods disarms the lectins. And because most people don't cook their oats enough, most people, maybe even quick oats, I said quick oats can be cooked in, in 10 minutes. Well, actually they're not. The starch structure has not been broken down in 10 minutes. And so that creates also lectins, which is high inflammation. Peanuts are commonly contaminated with mould and also refined sugar. Refined sugar just feeds the microbes. And so these are what we call the five allergen foods and that can cause a lot of excess mucus to be in the, in the respiratory, especially around the nasal. And so the, the result of that is that the person now breathes through their mouth. So when someone is a mouth breather, then, then you investigate why. And when a person is a mouth breather, often because of exposure to chemicals or moles or the allergen foods, and sometimes all of that, then the air is not being purified and it's not being pressurised and it's not balancing blood gases. And this is a big contributing factor to lung problems, to asthma. So my father, when I was a little girl, because I, I was the eldest girl in five children, there's my brother, then me and three youngers, I always has to bring him his puffer. And this is in the early 60s, late 50s. It was a rubber bulb and it had this fine glass tubing with a little cork on the end and a little area where you put the drugs in and Dad would have his puffer for his asthma. At the age of 50, he stopped dairy. <coughs> and no more asthma. And then my younger sister, Yvonne, I was eight when she was born. She was my baby. Terrible asthma. In fact, I, I remember the ambulance coming to our home a couple of times and taking my little sister away. And because I was the elder sister, I used to sit on a bed and read her stories. This is when she's three, four, five. And I remember, uh, I remember it's such a scary thing to see and I used to read her stories and sing her songs. So she didn't conquer her asthma till the age of 40 when she gave up these foods. It was hard for her because she liked them. <laughs> so imagine my concern when my fifth son is born and he's got severe asthma. So there is a genetic factor, but remember genetics loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. By the, by the time Peter was born, I used to do um, onion and garlic and different things on the children, but it didn't seem to help Peter. From his nostrils, his, they would flare with every breath. From his hips, his whole body would, every breath was like that. It was very scary. We rushed him to hospital several times, and this is an hour's drive through the mountains. And then... When I got to hospital and I'd look at the doctor's face, I could tell that Peter was very, very sick. So they would give him Ventolin. But I, th I saw that the only thing that really helped Peter was if I just held him and kept him calm. 
and kept him upright. He was mostly breastfed. Probably not until he was about 11, 12 months did he start to have a little bit of fruit. <coughs> so I used to think, well, we're in a rainforest, he's breastfed, and look at my baby, he's dying. And so I read a newspaper article that said, Ventolin reduces lung capacity. <coughs> The very drug to open the bronchioles because Ventolin is a bronchodilator that opens the bronchioles to allow more air in. So I thought, oh, I've got to do something. So I went to a naturopath. And the naturopath told me a whole program to give him. What I had to do was I had to totally eliminate these foods. We were having a bit of dairy, we were having a bit of wheat, we were having oats. So I stopped all the mucus forming foods. But what I noticed with Peter, whenever he'd get a cold, within 24 hours, he'd go into severe breathing distress. And that breathing distress would last for 24 hours, where his little body would like thump with every breath. You just feel so helpless. And the naturopath said to me to do a few things, to do hot and cold treatments on his chest. We'll be looking at that, uh, I think, tomorrow tomorrow when we look at water treatments, alternating hot and colds on his chest, and I was to give him an enema. Now by the time I got to the naturopath, Peter was, I think he was about 14 months by this stage. We'd already had several rushes to hospital. And that's no fun because he's my fifth child, he got a whole lot of kids, he's going through the rainforest. Yeah. And so I, w I wanted to be able to do something. I'd seen what had happened to my baby sister. I'd seen what had happened to my father. And I was just praying to God, what, what can I do here? And so I did the hot and colds, and I was to give him an enema. And what I did was I gave him an enema. I distracted him with his brother's um, submarine motor that had a battery in it. I could do anything to Peter when he was looking at that motor. <laughs> and I was able to give him the enema. The uh, breathing distress went from 24 hours down to five hours just by doing the hot and colds. And whenever he got a cold, I wouldn't give him anything to eat but watermelon. So it was very light food. He was still being breastfed at the time. To be able to do that when the child's 14 months old, one child would, f would read stories in the bedroom while we all ate our lunch. <laughs> and then we'd clean it all up. And then the child that f ate read the stories, um, another child would go in and read stories and they'd eat that. So, you know, you can't tell a child they can't eat when everyone's eating, so, you know, to, to make it easy. And when he had breathing distress, if he got upset, it just got so much worse. But it was still five difficult hours of this severe breathing distress. When Peter was two and a half, I gave birth to my sixth child. And when Peter was two and a half and I went into labour, Peter got a cold. You know what God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, <laughs> but of power and of love and a sound mind. The opposite of fear is faith. And I know, the Bible tells me that God will not put me through anything that is too much for me. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, there's no temptation taken you, but, that, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not tempt you above what ye are able. And with that temptation, make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. What a beautiful promise to hold on to. I gave birth to my uh, sixth child. I was with some friends today talking about it. The whole baby just flew out of me with the bag intact. <laughs> I squatted all through my labour <laughs> and I squatted every day through my uh, pregnancy to open that area and baby was born. And Peter never got breathing distress. Well, I thank God. I know that there are many methods of healing, but only one that God approves of. And it's the method of healing that works with the healing powers that he put into the body. So from the age of two and a half, Peter never has had another asthma attack. If you look at Peter today, it looks like a bodybuilder. Mm. How old's Peter now? Peter's probably about 38, something like that. Peter has his own three little children and none of them have asthma. 
See, you can change the genetics. So Peter conquered this at the age of two and a half. But it took a lot of work. And when people talk to me about conquering asthma and I tell them what to do, a lot of them are very sad because, I f and we'll cover this when we look at child nutrition, a lot of, and we're doing that on Friday, a lot of parents don't seem to have control over their children. So that's why I say we've got to start with the mother and father's relationship. <laughs> we've got to start with training the children from, from a young age, always being kind but consistent and firm. Another thing that I did with Peter, we had a herb growing in our backyard and I brought it into our backyard. It's called plantain. It's also called ribwort. And that's broadleaf plantain and this is narrowleaf plantain. Again, it has the ribs. And it's just a weed, really, and it has a seed head that looks a bit like that. And I had read that it is an expectorant on the lungs, so I used to cook up big pots of this. And whenever Peter had a cold, I'd cook up big pots of it. I'd just bring it to the boil, turn it off. I had so many leaves in it was black. And then I'd squeeze lemon in it and it'd go clear, put a little bit of honey in it. And when you only give your children water to drink, they just love this. <laughs> and Peter drank it and drank it and drank it. And I believe that that was also a contributing factor to, to strengthening his lungs. Yes? Plantain. Yeah, it's just a weed. Plantain. Yep, it'll be everywhere. All over my yard. <laughs> All over your yard, that's right. So you've got your broadleaf plantain and your narrow leaf plantain. Yes? So you, you cooked the greens and he ate the greens? With plantain? No, Green no. Tea. I made a tea. tea. Oh, okay. So I'd have a big pot and I'd put the leaves in. I'd bring it to the boil and I'd immediately turn it off and let it cool, strain the leaves out, and he would just drink the tea. It was so strong the tea was black, but I'd put lemon in it and it seemed to bleach the looked a little bit better than drinking blacks, black stuff. And I believe that that also helped. And whenever Peter had a cold, I'd, I'd cook this up for him and he was very protective of his tea. <laughs> didn't want the other children to drink it, but we didn't mind because it was a very scary thing to see Peter so sick. So, it's so it was so nice to, to see that. Now, the naturopath contacted me, said, Barbara, I'm about to speak to the Asthma Foundation. He said, you know more than me about asthma now. How do we learn? We actually learn by doing it. He said, you know more about me than asthma now, and I want you to tell me exactly what you did. So I told him exactly what I did, and, he, and Peter was five at the time. He spoke to the Asthma Foundation. He said at first, this is in the town where he lived, they were a little bit resistant. But as he spoke, I think he gave the story of Peter, which is a remarkable story. Because Peter was diagnosed with severe physiological asthma, which medically we are told there is no cure for that. And it's, it was genetic. Well, we, we know it was genetic. But remember, genetics loves the gun. It's lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And this is a study called epigenetics that you can turn the genes on and off by lifestyle. The next day the naturopath rang me. He said, uh, he said they were very receptive. And he said, after the talk, a lady came up to me and she was describing her son. And he said to me, it's as if she was describing Peter. He said, this little boy was seven. He was on steroid drugs for the asthma. He had severe constipation from the drugs. He was on a glycerin enema every day and he'd been given two weeks to live. And then he said to me, and look at Peter. I got off the phone and had a moment's silence and I just said, thank you, Father in heaven. But it took work. And then the little book, Ministry of Healing, it's one of my favourite health books, the author says, the use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort that many are not prepared to give. But in the end, it will be found that nature untrammeled does her work wisely and well. 
You see, Peter didn't get better straight away. But 24 hours to five hours, I was excited, but that five hours was still tough. But you know what I found? Every time he got a cold, the breathing distress became less and less. I had to give it a bit of time. I first started doing it when he was 14 months old. And the last asthma attack he had, I think, when he was about two. And then he never had another asthma attack again. In fact, he's a tiler now and a carpenter, and people ask him where he works out in the, what, what bodybuilding program does he do, because he's like this. <laughs> in fact, when, when all the boys visited, because I got three boys, they were doing a thousand push-ups a day, <laughs> 20 at a time. <laughs> they kept jumping down on the floor, push-ups, push-ups. So physical strength is, is very important. The exercise is very important. And I remember the naturopath said to me, everything you're doing to Peter, he will be as strong as an ox. Well, he is. And yet he was born with severe physiological asthma. <coughs> asthma is an allergy. And asthma can be conquered. One mother said to me, my little boy, I take him to, I take him to hospital every week in the winter with asthma. So I began to investigate. I said, where does the little boy sleep? He's on the bottom bunk. I said, where's the bedroom? Oh, it's in the back of the house, not much sunshine there. I said, what's the mattress up the top like? She said, ah, oh, it's not very good. It's actually had mould. So every time the boy in the top bunk moves, what's coming down on that little boy? And there's no sunshine coming into that bedroom, so the air's not very good. I said, do you live out in the country? She said, yes. I said, when you get off the phone, can you get that mattress, take it way out into the paddock and put a match to it? <laughs> Please. <laughs> and I said, and the little boy, don't let him sleep in that room anymore. Take him out into one of the sunny rooms. Well, she never took him to hospital again. You see, what it was with that little boy was the mould. <coughs> And I had another mother tell me that her little baby was getting asthma. Take to the hospital and giving the drug. Well, it's a very scary thing when your child is, is very sick. And then she, she, it was a sunny day, so she decided to take the mattress outside and put it in the sun. And when she lifted it up, it had black mould all underneath it. Maybe some water damage, maybe the baby's bottle spilt there and she didn't realise and it went under. Mould grows where there's moisture in, in sitting in a still place. You have to be very careful of that mould. It's toxic. That's why the Bible says if there's mould in a cloth, burn it. If it's mould in the house, the, the house has to be destroyed. It's toxic stuff. No, I don't think every house with mould in it has to be destroyed because sometimes all you need to do is to fix the leaking tap. All you need to do is cut a few trees down and get a more, bit more sun in the house. So yeah, it, uh, it can be remedied and that's what the Bible says. If there's mould in the house, take the mortar out between the bricks, clean it all up, re-mortar it, shut it up for two weeks and it may be that the mould doesn't grow back, then you've saved the house. But if it grows back, it's... It has to, has to be destroyed. And that's why in every case of respiratory, the cause must be ascertained. I'm going to introduce you now to LSD. This is God's LSD. <coughs> Low, slow and deep. That's how we should be breathing. Not the high chest breathe, but the low, abdominal breathe. Many people are high chest breathers because the skirt or the pants or the belt is too tight or their posture is so bad like this. So how do you get a better posture? Strengthen your abdominal muscles. When you strengthen your abdominal muscles they're all connected to the spine and strengthening the abdominal muscles. Have you done your push-ups today? I did 30 this morning. Push-ups every day, well, at least five days a week, to strengthen those abdominal muscles. And Pilates-type exercises, you can get DVDs on Pilates. It's all about core strengthening. We talked about core strengthening to help the spine. If there's been a slipped disc, if there's been any 
any injuries in the spine, take control of your injury and strengthen your core. Strengthen your core muscles, which will help to hold that injuries. I've had some major injuries to my back. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but I manage it now. I don't have back pain if I give it the right conditions. And one is keeping my core strong. <coughs> also, it's keeping well hydrated. Also, it's going to bed earlier. Also, it's thanking God every day for this body that I live in and its inbuilt ability to heal itself. Sunshine every day so that you've got vitamin D so that your bones get those minerals so you've got strong bones. Inhale through the nose. A bit of training there. Did you try exercising this morning and only breathe through your nose? Not easy. Some people say, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. No, no, no. When you breathe out through your mouth, you lose too much carbon dioxide. Too much carbon dioxide in the blood is not good. That's hypoxia. Not enough carbon dioxide in the blood will, will prevent your oxygen getting into the cell. So we have 25 trillion red blood cells. We have 270 million hemoglobin on the red blood cell. And every hemoglobin has four docking sites for oxygen. And so at the, at the gaseous exchange in the lungs, when the blood comes through with four molecules of carbon dioxide, it can pick up four molecules of oxygen. But when a person's breathing through their mouth, losing too much carbon dioxide, then only two molecules of oxygen come along. So these four molecules of oxygen, only two can be picked up. So breathing through the nose allows the body to balance the blood gases. What are the blood gases? The blood gases are oxygen. Breathing in and out through the mouth, the person can have too much oxygen in the blood, but it can't get into the cell. And it's in the cell that we need it. Because when your cell has oxygen, it'll give you 18 times more energy compared to a cell with no oxygen. And there are cells not getting enough oxygen because the people are breathing in and out through their mouth. The other blood gas that it, that's essential is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the gaseous waste from the combustion of oxygen and glucose at the cellular level. Again, you can have too much carbon dioxide and you can have not enough carbon dioxide. There's another blood gas and that's nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is produced in the sinus and nitric oxide is only produced when we nose breathe. When people mouth breathe, they're not producing the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is antibacterial, it's anti fungal, it's antimicrobial. So when we breathe in and out through our nose, it allows the blood gases to be balanced. But there's more. Carbon dioxide and nitric oxide both have vasodilatory effects. That means they open the blood vessels. And when the blood vessels are opened, that's more blood. That's more oxygen, that's more nutrients, that's more white blood cells, it's more water, it's more waste being taken away. So both carbon dioxide and nitric oxide are vasodilators, opening the blood vessels. But there's something even more exciting about this. Carbon dioxide is not only a vasodilator, it's a bronchodilator. What's a bronchodilator? That's what Ventolin is. A bronchodilator, opening the bronchioles, allowing more air to come in and out. Do you remember why I stopped giving Peter Ventolin? Because it reduces lung capacity. So I was looking for another bronchodilator. I didn't find out about carbon dioxide being a bronchodilator and Peter was long over his asthma. But my sister Yvonne discovered it. And she discovered it 
by investigating the work of Professor Buteyko. Have you heard of Buteyko? Professor Buteyko is a Russian professor. He's dead now. But he was in the First World War as a, as a mechanic. He was quite a brilliant young man. He used to fix up all the cars. When the war was over, he thought, I think I'll study the human body because I know how an engine works, so I know how to fix it. If I learn how the body works, I reckon I'll know how to fix the body. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But the, the training program for young medics is gruelling. Sometimes they're on 24-hour calls seven days a week. It's very hard being a doctor. And his blood pressure was going up, he was getting overweight. And he looked in the reflection on a glass one night and he looked at himself and he was shocked at what he saw. He was overweight, he was hunched like this, and his mouth was hanging open. And it just confronted him. In fact, it gave him a shock. He was just a young man in his 30s. <laughs> and he looked terrible. And the first thing he did was put his shoulders back and close his mouth. When you mouth breathe, it changes your whole facial structure so that the jaw hangs down. When you nose breathe, it brings everything back into balance. So he, th this, this vision, and it wasn't just a vision, it was reality, what he saw in the glass that night, it actually forced him to start breathing through his nose and start doing God's LSD, low, slow and deep. You see, the abdominal muscles were designed to aid in the breathing process. So he started to do these simple things and then he had a guy one night having an asthma attack and he noticed the man was breathing through his mouth. And he said to the man, shut your mouth. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? <laughs> Please close your lips. <laughs> and the man looked terrified because when a person is lacking breath, the reaction is to open the mouth wide to try and get more air, but you actually don't get any more air. You get more air breathing through the nose. And then he told the man to hold his breath. <laughs> so the man did what he was told and breathed low, slow and deep. Do you know when you high breathe, you stimulate your sympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system is your fight and flight nervous system. That's breathing shallow, mouth, high here, but when you breathe low, slow and deep, you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic nervous system is your calming, peaceful nervous system. And he just saw a total change in this man when he got him to nose breathe, hold his breath, just briefly, and breathe low, slow and deep. Here is the method. Five seconds in, hold for three seconds, five seconds out. In fact, if someone's stressed out, just get them to do that ten times. And it stimulates their parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, what's your parasympathetic nervous system? Peace. Think of para-peace. Your sympathetic nervous system, fight and flight, up here. <laughs> How many people having Pantex do that? You know, the first thing you do when someone's having a panic attack, tell them to close their mouth nicely. <laughs> and breathe low, slow and deep and it will calm, calm the body. And they'll be starting to get more oxygen. And when your cells have more oxygen, they're going to get 18 times more energy compared to a cell that's not getting enough oxygen because it's high shallow breathing, losing too much carbon dioxide, the blood can't pick up the oxygen, the cell can't get the oxygen. Can you see it gets in a vicious cycle? And so Professor Butego became quite famous with his theory. <laughs> and you can go to hospitals, many hospitals today have Butego method of breathing. I think it's called BMB, Buteyko Method of Breathing, of teaching people how to sleep, how to 
breathe low, slow and deep, but it's in an asthma attack that they breathe lightly, not losing their carbon dioxide, holding their breath, raising their carbon dioxide levels, and those carbon dioxide levels, as they raise, they have the, a bronchodilator effect. And this is how my sister Yvonne finally got off the last of her Ventolin by learning the Buteco method of breathing. Or what we do today is we just Google, isn't that right? Buteco, Buteco. That's how you spell his name, the Buteco method of breathing. And I think on the internet now you can just get classes of how how to do the Buteco method of breathing, which is a specific method of breathing that someone would use when they're having an asthma attack. <coughs> so number one, you turn the tap off with asthma. You stop the allergen foods. Number two, when the person has an asthma attack, then you do the simple natural treatments to get more oxygen in, more <coughs> carbon dioxide that has that bronchodilator effect, breathing through the nose, more carbon dioxide, more nitric, ax nitric oxide which dilates the blood vessels, which means more blood delivery, more oxygen delivery to the cell. What an incredible body we live in with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. We also find that these are some of the main causes of sinus problems. We had a nurse, ear, nose and throat specialist nurse, she attended our program, she said, you would not believe the green slime we pull out of people's sinuses when we do sinus operations. And she said, and every doctor that I um, assist tell me it's fungus in <laughs> the sinus. Ooh. And in 1990, a group of doctors in the Mayo Clinic, they proved that sinus problems are caused by fungus in the sinus. <laughs> so you know what my question is, why is it there? How did it get there? Well, year after year of these mucus-forming foods, year after year of the, the mucus build-up here, year after year of mouth breathing and not getting that air purified or even moving through, can you see we've got a stagnant area there? And where does mould and fungus live in your house? Well, hopefully not in your house, but where does it survive? in the dark, moist areas, or here, right up here. <laughs> and then they go and have an operation and the doctor pulls all the green slime out and then they go back and no nothing's ever addressed about whether they're breathing through their mouth or their nose or they're eating these foods. So we had a lady attend our program and she had major sinus problems. And her sinus was so bad, she was just about living on headache tablets because the sinus was so painful that she was getting daily headaches. And she was only early 40s. She was overweight. She was miserable. And so we taught her about the foods. And we don't serve any of those foods at our health retreat. We show, we show alternatives. We show the, the, uh, the coconut milk or the... Um, and there's many alternatives today. We show them the, the spelt flour, the gluten-free flours. We use millet, cooked millet, so it's beautiful and soft like a porridge instead of oats. Uh, try macadamia butter, try almond butter. There's lots of alternatives there. And we use coconut sugar or maple syrup or honey. So there's, there's lots of alternatives that you can use today. And we gave her golden seal powder. Golden seal has a nickname. It's called king of tonics to all mucous membranes. And this is all mucous membranes up here in the sinus. And it's also antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial. It's a very expensive herb. We can't get it in Australia at the moment. So every time I leave the US, I go home with 
a packet of gold and seal powder. When I got into Australia, they're very strict about what you bring in, so I declared it. And in Australia, in Sydney, you can't fly a plane after 11 or before 6. So when you fly into Australia at 6 a.m., there are about five aeroplanes all landing at once. So they're trying to move you, move you through fast because hundreds of people. And the man said to me, uh, what have you got? I said, oh, herbs. He said, what are you going to do with them? I said, uh, make tea. He said, I'll go through. So I got all my gold and silk powder. <laughs> I, got, I got it through. It looks like gold and it's probably as expensive as gold. It's very, very, it's expensive, but it's a very powerful herb. You see, it takes seven years for the little roots to grow before they can harvest it. So what we do with the golden seal, you buy it as a powder and then you might put it on a plate and get a straw and sniff. But you don't sniff hard, you just go little tiny sniffs. If you sniff hard, you'll feel like the top of your head's going to blow off. <laughs> so just little tiny sniffs is probably the easiest way. Don't, don't let your nose blow out and lose that gold dust. It's very precious. So you just sniff in a tiny little bit, just a pinch, into both nostrils. It's very bitter, so when you taste bitterness at the back of your throat, you know it's hit its mark. And then you try not to blow your nose for even 10 minutes, so, so you allow that golden seal up there to do its work. When you do blow your nose, it'll be fluorescent yellow. It's very, very bright yellow. But as much as you can, you don't. If you, if you sniff in too fast, you'll start sneezing and then, of course, you'll lose all that precious. So just very slight sniffs. And we, are, we got this lady to do it three times a day. By the time she went home, she was having no headache tablets because her sinus was relieving and she wasn't getting the headache. Yes? Could you put it in a vaporizer and... Well, it's a pity you're not... What you do when you sniff the powder is you get it straight to the spot. Mm -hmm. So in a vaporizer, it would be greatly diluted. And you want that powder to touch those mucous membranes because, remember, it's a tonic to them. She left. She was very happy about what she'd learned. Two years later, the lady came back, and when she walked in, I didn't recognise her. She was probably about 170 pound and she was down to about 110 pound. She looked good, she had a new set of clothes. She said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, I'm trying. <laughs> she said, I came with those serious sinus problems. She said, I have not taken a, tab uh, a headache tablet since I left here. She said, I don't have any sinus problems anymore. She said, when I left here, the next couple of colds I got, you know, maybe two colds a year, there was a bit of sinus, sinus problem, but you know what a cold is? It's a house clean. What are you coughing and, and, and blowing out of your nose? Waste, rejoice. Where was it before you had the cold? <laughs> cold is a wonderful thing. We don't like them, but it does clean the house. She said, the last time I got a cold, I didn't even have any sinus pain at all. Every time she got a cold, more waste is coming out. You see, you have a look, you go and have an operation and all the green slime's pulled out. Well, if you don't have an operation, when's it going to come out? When you get a cold. When you get a cold, when you're, when you're blowing the nose. She said to me, I feel so good, I've just come back to just tell you what a great effect it had and how it's just revolutionised my life. I'm a different person. She said I was only, well she was 44 now, but she said I was only 42 when I came here, but she said I felt like an old woman. She said it was debilitating my life. She said that after about a year my mother said to me, you've lost too much weight, I don't think you look healthy, I want you to go to the doctor and have a blood test. So she went to the doctor, had a blood test, and the doctor said, I don't know why you came to me. That's the best blood results I've seen. What had she done? She'd implemented, me. She'd implemented those basic laws of health. She used to love 
cheese on toast. She used to love her croissants. She said, they have no attraction, no attraction for me now because she said, I just feel so good. And she said, and I've also learnt delicious desserts and delicious food that you can eat that is, that is not going to harm your body. So it's lovely to see people's lives turn so completely around by implementing these simple lifestyle changes. Most people that have respiratory problems, it's because the body is reacting to some sort of allergen. And when you start coughing up yellow lumps, when I was a nurse and I coughed up yellow lumps because I had a cold, I would think, I've got an infection. I must go and get an antibiotic. Do you know what I think today? If I cough up a lump, and I certainly did when I had a couple of weeks of my cold and cough up in Germany, you know what I think? Oh, there's my dead white blood cells are doing a great job in down in there. <laughs> and it passes. It passes. But you've got to give it time. And probably the reason my mind hung on a bit longer because I was lecturing to students six hours a day. And probably if I hadn't done that, I would have recovered a bit quicker. But I've recovered. And have you noticed? You do. And you've got to give it time. Are there any questions before we close? Yes? What about nanny parts and stuff to clean out? What about nanny parts? Yeah, you can use those. Salt water is quite good. But, um, and they certainly have an effect. Um, they don't hurt. Got this machine called the Vaj, where you suck it in one nose and suck it out the other. Oh, yeah, you could try that. <laughs> yeah? Pardon? <laughs> professor Buteyko is the professor that came up with the Buteyko method of breathing. And if you Google Professor Buteyko, then, then you'll, you'll get a, a spiel on his method of breathing to control asthma, yeah? Is there a specific kind of skill powder brand that is better than other kinds of I'm not familiar with, um, with the products in the US, but I would imagine it would all be much the same. It's fluorescent yellow, it's very bright yellow. I think my, my daughter ordered hers from Frontier, Well, I like to look at what a herb does and the nickname of Golden Seal is King of Tonics to All Mucous Membranes. So you can wash it with your eye. You can sniff it. You can gargle it for a sore throat. It'll heal a stomach ulcer. For UTI, urinary tract infection, it'll come out in the urine. And remember, it's antibacterial, antifungal. And we mix it with, with uh, slippery elm for irritable bowel. Remember, it's king of tonics to all mucous membranes. Could it work as a poultice? I think it's a waste to do as a poultice because you want to get it up and in there. Yes? Uh, well, with a capsule, you would open it and there you've got the powder there. Yeah. But you would take a capsule if you had a urinary tract infection and it would come out that way. I have a question. Earlier you were talking about digestion and you were talking about a book called Observations on Something by Dr. William Beaumont. Yeah, yeah. Now that's out of print. Oh, okay. But you could try and get it. Dr. William Beaumont. What's the name of the book? Oh, well, it's a long name. I think it's um, ob observations on the physiology of digestion, I think. Yes? What about deviated septum? Deviated septum. The best way to heal a deviated septum is to breathe through the nose because what nose breathing does is it opens the, opens the channels at the back. 
And as you can imagine, um, probably what the doctor will suggest is that you have it drilled out. But can you imagine how painful and not always successful that is? And yet just breathing through your nose will naturally open it. Why do people yawn? Usually because they're lacking oxygen. <laughs> Wim Hof's great. And my son Peter loves Wim Hof. And I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Wim Hof. Wim Hof, through, the <clears throat> through a certain way of breathing, he controls his body temperature and walks through the Himalayan mountains in shorts and T-shirts. But you could Google Wim Hof and have a look at what he does. But he also, it's the method of breathing. There's a book called Breath by James Nestor. And what I love about this book is it looks at Wim Hof and it looks at uh, Professor Butego and it looks, looks at quite a, a few others. And there's another one, it looks at Catlin George. Catlin George um, lived amongst the Red Indians in about, uh, I think, the 1830s. And I got his book, very hard to read because it's written in such old English. And how the American Red Indians prized nose breathing. In fact, the the Indian women would breastfeed their baby to sleep, lay the baby down and press their lips together until they were sure that their baby was breathing through the, through the nose. And he tells about a, an altercation between a, one of the white traders and, and, an Indian, and an Indian. And the white trader was twice the size of the Indian. And they were going to have a duel, but thankfully they, they worked it out. But Catelyn George went to the Indian later and he said, weren't you worried? That, that guy's twice your size. He said, no, I would have beat him. He was a mouth breather. <laughs> yes. So my illustration for golden seal in the eyes is golden seal is king of tonics to all mucous membranes. So wherever you've got mucus, you can use it. So you can wash the eye with it. Um, what we do is we use a combination of eye bright, which is a dried leaf, which is a specific for all eye problems, and golden seal. So the rule of thumb when you're making a tea is a teaspoon of the tea leaf to a cup of boiling water. So you'd pour a cup of boiling water on the, on the eye bright and then you would just put maybe a pinch of the golden seal in and then let that cool and then strain it. And we found it very good for dry eyes. We found it very good for any sort of eye problem. And you, you can buy little eye baths. So you pour the tea into the eye bath and then, and then bathe your eye and blink your Blink your eyes. So you could use that for glaucomas, for cataracts, for weepy eyes, dry eyes, sore eyes, red eyes, anything like that. Yeah? Anything for floaters? For floaters, you can try castor oil, and you can try that eye wash too, but you could also try castor oil. And with castor oil, you, you can either put castor oil in your eye or you can put a drop of castor oil on your finger and just wipe it across your eyelid. It'll penetrate quite deep. So that's for floaters. Yes? I was wondering about a CPAP machine. Well, what in his book, and James Nestor's book, Breath, is a fascinating book. I found the first chapter a bit tough where he talks about how our lungs developed over 60 million years and our noses developed over 100 million years. That was sort of, it's a bit difficult to get through that. But once you get through that, it's quite a fascinating book. And he and a friend of his went through an experiment of 10 days of having their noses plugged up. And when they had their noses plugged up, forcing them to mouth breathe, their sleep apnea went through the roof. They needed CPAP machines. Their blood pressure went up. <laughs> In fact, it was quite incredible. And then they unplugged their noses and uh, taped their mouths up and forced their body to breathe through the nose. 
And, and they were being monitored every day, these two guys, for this experiment. Blood pressure came down, sleep apnea basically wiped out, no need for CPAP machine anymore. It was quite incredible. We have found when people stop these allergens, which greatly reduces the mucus in the eustachian tubes and they can breathe easier at night. And also when people are carrying a lot of excess weight and they lie down, that can also um, put pressure on the, on the breathing tubes. Yes? That's true, yeah. So when a person's using the sleep apnea machine, it sort of, it's very hard to breathe through your nose. And you can, of course, encourage nose breathing by going to sleep with a little bit of tape. You don't have to tape your whole mouth up, just a little tape under the nose to the chin. And so you don't wake up in terror in the middle of the night thinking someone's killing you because you can't breathe. You could tape the mouth up for an hour a day for about three days before you actually sleep with the tape overnight. Yes? Okay, I can list a uh, naughty things up there. You've got dairy and something wheat. Is it Hybridised wheat. It's wheat. All wheat is hybridised, so I could almost take that away and just say wheat. The only wheat that's not hybridised is the ancient grains like your spelt and your ankenhorn. Can Pardon? Hyssop. Ah, you could try hyssop, but what you've got to find out is why do you have so much mucus? So that's, you know, there are certainly herbs that can help, but remember there is no wonder cure. The only wonder cure is the human body when you give it the right conditions. But if someone's got a lot of excess mucus, you've got to find out why, why it is there. But I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. Our time is up and I know everyone's keen to get to bed by nine. And tomorrow night we'll show you why. <laughs>